start with the introductions. Let me start with the introduction for everyone. Thank you for coming to the education panel on our first symposium for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies, our first international symposium. Uh, my name is David Ortiz. I am the faculty fellow for the Center for Latin American and Border Studies here at New Mexico State University. And I will be the moderator today for this panel. Uh, this panel is composed of four presenters that all had some very, very interesting work that they'll be presenting to us. The first, uh, uh, well, uh, the first presenter schedule was Dr. Antonio Lopez Pelaez, but he's having a little bit of trouble logging in. Um, so we will move on in a different uh, order. But let me first introduce all of our panelists. Dr. Antonio Lopez Pelaez uh, is uh, a, a scholar in Spain. Uh, he, his work is characterized by the collaboration between interdisciplinary work and working in teams. His uh, research interests are on digital social work, social work with groups, social services, new technologies, and new. Um, he leaders uh, group research Koinonia, which is formed by several researchers from different countries with different uh, projects. Um, while COVID-19 was happening, he organized three seminars with more than 4,000 participants and re, uh, did a YouTube channel that's now going on, which is called Social Digital Work and organized the first international Congress on social digital, um, uh, digital social work, sorry. Uh, he has, uh, he's a current member of the group on work for designing systems of social wellness and social work in Madrid and Vélez, Malaga in Spain. We also have Dr. Weili Sun, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Foundations. She received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and a graduate portfolio in Women and Gender Studies. Her research examines the social and political dimensions of discipline policy reforms and culturally responsive school leadership. She is currently studying social political context of the school to prison pipeline from high school principals perspectives and the impact of COVID-19 in borderland schools. In the summer of 2016, she was a Bill Archer graduate fellow with the University of Texas system, where she spent summer working as policy analyst with a leading civil rights organization in Washington, DC. In the summer 2019, the American Education Research Association named her as a congressional fellow for 2019-2020. And she's worked as a legislative fellow for a member of Congress and her uh, user education research expertise to inform public policy. Welcome, Dr. Sun. Uh, we also have Cynthia Wise. Cynthia Wise received her educational, her doctorate from Educational Leadership and Administration from New Mexico State University in 2021. And rather than stopping there, she immediately enrolled in a master's in government program with hopes of being the first recipient of the uh, proposed doctorate in border studies. Before returning to New Mexico State University, she was an Emmy Award winning journalist in both radio and television broadcasting. Cynthia serves as graduate assistant in the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies Department is vice president of the Graduate Student Council and actively participates in community service both on and off campus. Welcome, Cynthia. Uh, Graciela Larrea de la Rosa is a PhD student of the Doctor in Social Sciences uh, with a concentration in government and public policy of the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez, the UACJ, our sister university. She's a researcher in training in the field of higher education and social justice. Uh, apprentice of the Epistemologies of the South. Uh, she's an undergraduate professor in the Bachelor of Education at UACJ between 20, 2006 and 2014. And she has experience in university administration in matters of foreign languages, uh, extraordinary federal funding programs, postgraduate education programs. She's a Juarense feminist and inhabitant of the Juarez El Paso border, a mother of a girl, a young man, and a young university student. Welcome, Graciela. So uh, we, will, we will begin with Dr. Uh, Wei Ling Sung's presentation to
to accommodate um, uh, 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 the, the order of the presenters while we hopefully get uh, the ability for Dr. Lopez Pelaez to come in. Um, I just want to point two things before this. Uh, the presentations are going to be 12 minutes each, and there will be a Q&A session at the end of this. Uh, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. There's a Q&A button to, uh, field, to put your questions in there, and uh, we will make sure to field them to the presenters. So uh, without further uh, ado, I'll let you with Dr. Sun, and I'll try to have uh, Antonio come in and, and join us. Thank you. Dr. Sun, please. Thank you uh, for the great introduction. And uh, uh, let me share my screen real quick. Um, OK. So um, thank you so much, and it's a it's a privilege to be invited into this session um, and uh, to uh, present my work and um, and uh, alongside with all these great faculty members and colleagues. And uh, um, as you can see, I have a COVID baby. She was born in 2019, so she's uh, um, she's been on the screen with me <laughs> with all the Zoom meetings. So um, so forgive me if. Uh, um, if, uh, if she's just watching the show with everybody. And uh, um, so my research is, um, um, the title is Beyond Digital Divide, COVID-19 and Education Inequality in the Mexico-US Borderland. Um, this project was, uh, uh, I started with this project when the COVID-19 started um, in, uh, in, during 2020. And uh, um, it has been, uh, um, a quite an experience with the school district and watching them experiencing what has has been going on in the um, during the the COVID nineteen um, school closure online cl uh, classes and then um, so let me see if I can move on to the next okay so um, in the U S education system um, COVID nineteen pandemic and uh, um, it doesn't really um, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, it doesn't really um, bring up the inequality issues. It's already been existing uh, before the pandemic. And then um, during and the pandemic. And then during the pandemic. To okay. The <laughs> I'm sorry. I need to get this baby out of this screen for a little bit. Just um, give, me, give me a sec. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so before the pandemic, the inequality issues has been happened. Um, all, all the issues about um, learning challenges and then unequal resource allocation in public schools. The COVID-19 pandemic really bring those issues up and visibilizing all these issues. And that it also includes disproportionate learning losses, especially for black and brown communities. And then another issue is the bro uh, broadband accessibility. So I remember when I was in um, DC um, working in the Senate, pre-pandemic, um, there were a lot of uh, lobbyists came in and um, trying to um, lobby for um, extending broadband access for public schools. But um, during the pandemic, um, it brings the, the access of broadband into the light and then um, school district and uh, policymakers started to make uh, policies and um, um, take actions to um, let students to access to broadband um, without any challenges. And so these are these are the um, issues that has been happened before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, um, all these inequality issues in education has been enhanced and um, aggregate, aggravated um, uh, during the online learning phase. And then, 
So my research questions uh, are, how has COVID-19 pandemic and the systemic racism impacted campus operations in a rural school district on a daily basis during the time of school closure and the school reopening? And how has the district distributed the SR fund to address education inequalities during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know um, uh, due to the time limit, um, I will just um, I will just answer the first questions and then um, and then introduce a little bit about how the SR fund has been uh, has been used um, during the pandemic. And then um, and so here is the oh, here is the theoretical framework. So I use um, I use the counter storytelling as uh, one of the theoretical framework as most of the um, participants in the borderland school district are uh, majority Latino Latina populations and they're serving in the school that is uh, uh, over 90 percent um, student of uh, Hispanic who are um, uh, categorized as Hispanics in in that school district, and um, and also I use the culturally responsive school leadership framework, especially um, the as uh, the element of critical self awareness of col colorblind ideologies um, to understand the the experience of um, of the students and teachers and school leaders in that school district um, during the COVID nineteen pandemic, even though we're not quite over the pandemic. So I would just say it's a, um, during the pandemic and then um, uh, in the face of online learning and then the school re reopening, school closure and then school reopening um, uh, semesters. And then um, the next page is the methodology. So it's a single case study um, and uh, um, the school district is located in uh, um, in El Paso area, and then uh, it's in the rural area. Uh, we, I call it Borderland Independent School District. And um, I uh, conducted seven focus groups with school leaders, teachers, and students, um, groups with school leaders and groups with teachers and groups with students, they're separated. And then uh, 46 um, interviews so far, uh, in-depth interviews with central office administrators, campus level school leaders, nine school teachers, 13 high school students, and one school counselors. Um, and the interviews is still ongoing, um, so I will um, continue um, <clears throat> Um, the 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 finding is still evolving. So this the finding I'm presenting right now is not the um, it's just the preliminary findings. And I use deduct deductive and inductive coding strategies and matrix uh, analysis to analyze the data. Um, so what makes the the uh, the school district unique in the borderland area is that um, this school is uh, very um, the the school leadership is very. Um, open to collaborate with university um, in the area. And so we, uh, I was a, able to um, uh, st stay in contact with the school leaders and faculty, uh, the teachers and the students in that school district so I can get more um, overall understanding of the district as a whole and, and their experience during the pandemic. And, um, and the this district is also um, very significant representation of the district in this area. Um, the the Borderland um, School District are mostly um, uh, Title I schools, which means they have very concentrated uh, poverty um, neighborhood in the in the area. And so this school is no exception um, other than than um, they are in the rural area. And so the findings, um, first of all, I, I separate them into students and teachers and school leaders. They, they have different experience, but um, overall the schools, they're acting as a, the district and the, the participants are actually act, acting as a whole representing the school district. And so at the student level, they have um, increasing numbers of homeless students because of the uh, their parents are are uh, they lose they they lost their jobs and so 
this is one of the issue that um, the school district is tackling is the, the issue, uh, the increasing numbers of homeless students. And then um, um, there is no exception um, other than the news is talking about is there the, the trauma and the loss that students are experiencing. Um, the increasing um, numbers of um, uh, child abuse is, is an issue. And then uh, students also are dealing with the loss of their family members um, due to COVID-19. So that is one of the, th those are the challenges that the schools are facing and students are experiencing during the COVID-19. It's not that before um, COVID they are not experiencing, but, but during the COVID-19, because students have to stay at home, um, so they have no way out. So they they are experiencing more frequency of um, uh, uh, home abuse and, uh, and then um, and they have to uh, deal with the, the loss of family members due to COVID-19. And the second, um, and, the, and the next one is, um, oh, three minutes left, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, and so they, um, the child development also is a, a huge um, challenge for not high school students, but mostly um, elementary school students because they're a great level, uh, first grade level students, especially they're, they're, they start their schools in, um, in, in, in online settings. So they didn't learn how to cut use scissors, they didn't learn how to write, their hands are not, are, um, are, their motor skills are not being um, stimulated. And then they're also um, dealing with anxiety and depression. And the, also, def, uh, also the academic performance is, um, has, a, uh, they're facing challenges um, in terms of their acad academic performances. And then so at the teacher level, at overall teachers are experiencing burnout, they have to learn, um, they have to learn uh, techno the use how to use technologies, and they lost their privacy um, because there's video recorders in the classroom, and they don't know when the school administrators are monitoring them. And then at the district and campus operation level, um, the I I would like to highlight the most um, challenging part is that school leaders are facing increasing politics of whether they can uh, mandate students to wear masks or not. Um, during online learning, there's not such an issue, but after the uh, school reopening, they're, um, they're facing this kind, this type of um, work and the, um, that, that's impact, taking a lot of their time in, 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 instead of prioritizing, focusing on instructional leadership. And then um, the educators doesn't, they are not just educators now, they have to be a healthcare expert to make decisions, whether uh, healthcare decisions, whether the students need to go home or uh, what are the protocols that they need to um, process during the, uh, it, if they have students um, having some COVID symptoms. And, uh, um, and also they are facing short, shortage of personnel, not just shortage of teachers, but substitute teachers, social workers, counselors, uh, bilingual teachers and special ed teachers, um, and so this is the one of the highlight that I would I, I would like to say is that the district in the borderland area is facing even more um, resource allocation um, uh, challenges, and so here are the the. Um, uh, conclu here's the conclusion the implication is that their challenge is not just digital divide other than other than um, not having enough technology to provide for their students is that there are every other aspect of the learning experience for the students are still still um, facing a lot of challenges. And then also um, the concentrated poverty is bringing up a lot of issues and uh, unequal resource allocations and then um, and the mental health support. And it's not just for students, but, but also teachers and school administrators, they also need mental health support. And so ESSER funds has been created a great opportunity for school district to, uh, to address the learning um, learning loss. So uh, a lot of the um, initiatives are implemented due to uh, because they are uh, the school district received ESSER funds, which is they are able to provide summer programs 
tutoring programs, after school programs, and, and then they can focus um, on addressing issues um, and providing services for dual language programs. And, um, and then they, uh, because of the 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 shortage of uh, school personnel. Schools are reaching out to the communities for um, collaboration and collaborating with uh, mental health ser services in the community, so they can provide services not just in the school but for the school, uh, the students, family members as well. Um, so this is our this is my um, highlight of the research, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sun, for a very interesting and sobering uh, presentation. Um, uh, we appreciate it. Our next presenter would be Cynthia Weiss uh, from New Mexico State University. Her presentation is Frontera, No Barrera por los Transfronterizos, How COVID-19 Impacted the Education of Students Who Crossed the US-Mexico Border to Attend School. Cynthia. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Uh, I am working to share my screen. Not the most adept at technology, but we'll sure try. Uh, as Dr. Ortiz told you my title already, I'll just start with, uh, rather than going through the normal formatting because of time limitations, just imagine that my research questions are very similar to Dr. Sun's, uh, but deals with a different area of the region. Uh, we start with the question, what is a border? Um, and it's something that we need to reconceptualize uh, as we think about Los Transfronterizos, uh, the borders more than a line demarcating uh, the two nation states. It's a frontera where language and culture collide. It is a region with a lengthy history of colonization, genocide, uh, forced assimilation, ep and epistemicide. Uh, this presentation focuses uh, on my work in the area of the U.S.-Mexico border between Columbus, New Mexico, and uh, Puerto de Villa Palomas, Mexico. Uh, Palomas, as you can see from the slide, has a population about three times that of uh, Columbus. It is a region that's roughly the size of the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. It is a contested space uh, that saw Pancho Villa, uh, traveling through the streets during the Mexican Revolution to confront General Pershing. Um, the Frontera is a multinational, multinational, multicultural, multilingual region that creates a tension, uh, or what Anzaldúa calls a uh, napantla, that feeling of occupying a space between two worlds. Uh, many of those living in the Frontera face an internal tug of war, uh, kind of dual identity. My research focuses specifically on Los Fans Monterizos. Uh, these are children who are U.S. citizens, uh, but whose families live in Mexico uh, for whatever reason, mainly though, because they've been affected by U.S. immigration laws, which Gomberg Munoz 2017 said, confer certain rights on some, but not on others. Uh, before COVID-19, about 1,200 students were counted among Los Tans Fronterizos. The ever-increasing militarization of the border and anti-immigrant, anti-border wall rhetoric um, perpetuated by the far right and the Trump administration criminalized these children and normalized violence in their lives. Every morning and every afternoon, Los Tans Fronterizos walk by border guards from both sides, armed with semi-automatic weapons, and they're seemingly unfazed. The symbols of violence have become part of their everyday life. I first heard about Los Tans Monterizos from a newspaper article. In fact, many of the photos that you see in this presentation come from newspaper accounts of the phenomena. Uh, curious about it, I uh, decided that I was gonna go to Palomas to witness the phenomena for myself. I crossed the border into Mexico and encountered students already lining up to get into the United States at 5.30 in the morning. I don't know about you, I don't like to get up that early myself, but these are kids who did that every morning. I'll never forget this one little girl. She was three or four years old. She was wearing a pink sparkly coat and a uniform, 
a unicorn backpack. Um, she crossed the border just ahead of me in, in line and was confronted by a CBP agent who angrily demanded to see her papers. Mind you, this is a little girl who crosses the border every day and sees these same agents every single morning. The agent likely knew who she was and probably recognized her. Uh, still, she was further questioned. Why are you coming into the United States? I personally was stunned. The little girl answered oblivious to border politics and just, I'm going to school. Uh, how long will you be in the US? Well, till school gets out. Uh, once granted entrance into the country, she skipped down the sidewalk to the school bus stop as if nothing had occurred. And I was flabbergasted by the interaction. The little girl is one of roughly 1,300 who gets up between four and five in the morning to travel to the border to survive this harsh questioning of, by CBP and to do, endure a search of their backpacks every single day before they walk to a bus stop just inside the United States. The youngest ride a bus to Columbus Elementary School, which is about um, five minutes away, about a mile. Um, the older kids climb on other buses and ride 30 to 45 minutes to get to middle and high school in the community of Deming. So I put up with the nonsense. Yeah, I know that's a purely academic term um, and mine. Uh, the difference between the two school systems is the draw. As you can see from the screen, in Palomas, parents have to pay for textbooks, they pay for their children's desks, they pay an annual enrollment fee, and their children aren't taught English, they're Gracias. taught solely, excuse me? Some of the time. Sorry. Um, they're taught solely in their heritage language, um, which is a good thing, uh, but parents have chosen 1,280 of these kids um, to cross into Columbus where there's no tuition charged, at least in the de not in the Deming School District. Um, textbooks are provided for free and the students are immediately enrolled in classes taught in both English and Spanish. They're identified as ELL or English language learners. Uh, these transfronterizos make up more than a third of the school district student population. I chose to continue my research into this phenomena of los transfronterizos mainly because there is a severe gap in the literature. Uh, as I mentioned, there have been several news media accounts uh, dating back almost 30 years, but very few scholarly papers. This work is the first stage of a long-term critical mixed method study in discussing the current national and state policies uh, that affect education along the US-Mexico border and the assets, including navigational, linguistic, and familial capital as defined by Yoso, of both school professionals and parents and what they bring to the border community. Jumping to the pandemic, when it hit, these were the first kids to be impacted. When President Trump ordered the border closed, Los Transfronterizos were on the other side of the border. They're victims of what is described by Gumbarg Munoz as quote, a social hierarchy in which law is used to deny certain people rights and resources, leaving them politically disempowered and especially vulnerable to insecurity and exploitation. The move also denied these students their basic human rights to an education and rights afforded them under the New Mexico state constitution. Before the pandemic hit, many of the students attending Deming schools were already affected by the di digital divide uh, detailed by Dr. Sun. Uh, when schools were ordered to remote status, uh, federal, state, and local districts had to scramble. In Deming, computers were distributed to students, again, on the US side of the border, not for those on the other side. Uh, but for some, it still might as well have been a brick. Many people in this area, because of income levels, just simply can't afford even basic internet, much less the high-speed broadband that was required for Zoom classrooms. Realizing the issue was faced by millions of kids around the United States, the federal government changed the definition of campus from a piece of property the district owned to any reasonable contiguous geographic area 
that is used by the institution in direct support of or in a manner related to the institution's educational purpose. Translation, children's homes were now declared campuses. That allowed the district to use federal E-rate funds um, to partner with cell providers to provide mobile hotspots for children and connect to cell towers close to the border. But because of agreements between the United States and Mexico, cell service from U.S. providers doesn't reach very far into Mexico. And internet service in Palomas can cost upwards of 75 U.S. dollars per month, making it cost prohibitive for many impoverished families. Um, in Palomas, one of the business owners took it upon himself to open an internet cafe. But for some of these kids, even getting to that internet cafe was troublesome because buses weren't running anymore. So essentially they were being denied their education. Uh, as Dr. Sun mentioned, um, computers weren't the only issue. Um, many of the students crossing the border to attend school immediately stopped getting that free breakfast and lunch that they qualified for. Uh, but people like Esperanza Lopez, I'm sorry, Esperanza Lasoyo, uh, seen here on the left, found loopholes in the rules that allowed her to cross the border with what was termed humanitarian aid that came in the form of more than 400 meals a day, breakfast and lunch. And if you do the math, you can see that that meant there were about 800 kids who still weren't getting the food that they uh, needed uh, on a daily basis. So in conclusion, uh, this presentation is based on the early results of a long-term study of Transfronterizo students. Uh, in the future, I hope to expand this study to other border communities. Then we'll look at a longitudinal study on the academic achievement of Transfronterizo students. Uh, quick preview, uh, I have talked to a couple of transfronterizos who have gone on to both Yale and MIT. Uh, finally, the expansion of the study will include a qualitative interviews with families of these students from both sides of the border. And I look forward to any questions that you may have uh, once we're done. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for a fascinating and uh, sobering again presentation. Um, I am glad that class has been able to support some of this work and, and I, I hope that you can continue a brilliant career. Uh, Thank thankfully, so much, oh, you're very welcome. Thankfully, Dr. Antonio Lopez Pelaez was able to resolve some of the technical issues that he had. So now we have him here with us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pelaez. I already introduced you to everyone. I, I gave your bio to everyone. So I will just uh, say that you're from Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Madrid, Spain, and that the title for your presentation is Migrants, Education, and Social Inclusion After COVID-19, The Case of Spain. Please, Dr. Antonio Pelaez, López Pelaez. You're muted, Dr. Pelaez. Antonio, tienes que aprender el micrófono. De tu... el... Wait a minute. Hola, ¿me escucháis? Sí. Hello, sí. everybody. Sorry. Sorry for my... my... My problems with try to to share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. yes no. Okay. I'll, um, okay. Okay. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to to share with you my the result of my research. No, in the last in, in the last decade. No, about youth, migrants, um, and education. And first of all, I want to express my gratitude to Dr. David and the Center for Latin American and Border Studies for inviting me to the seminar, Regards from Granada. Um, I hope you can find interest in my results, no? Um, I want to talk to you about the impact of the pandemic for migrants uh, from Latin America and the Caribbean in Spain particularly in the area of education. 
and to pre um, I want to present some intervention strategies with migrants based on digitalization. But first, I think it's important to present briefly the research I'm doing on youth, migrants, and education. No, I will search group, and you can see that no, on the screen. Uh, and it's important to take in mind, as you can see on the screen, uh, social working health emergencies and austeri the welfare austerity policies, because in Spain and in Europe, um, these two issues, austerity and emergencies, are now very big issues. No? The coronavirus pandemic is having a profound impact with far reaching implications for the way people live and work across Europe and around the world. From my point of view, the COVID 19 disease has been managed in Spain and in Europe with two, two complementary strategies. The home confinement, the lockdown of population as a health strategy and digitalization and teleworking as an organizational strategy. The confluence of these circumstances drives to a non-reversed and accelerated digitalization process. In this context of accelerated social change, perspective of the social work education, it is necessary not to take into account not only the strategies for adaptation to the lockdown, no, but also the new emerging risks. For example, the educational risks associated with digitalization, COVID-19 and migrants. In the pandemic, we created a YouTube channel on digital social work. You can see page on the screen to favor the process of digital innovation social services with migrants. And we have interviewed social workers, good practices, and addressed digitalization as a tool for the integration of migrants. In Spain, we have um, done 12% of the population of Spain are migrants right now. And I think that is a very big issue in our country. No? El, you can see on the screen our, the chair, which I'm director now, the chair of innovation in social services and dependency. dependency. And I'm currently participating in the expert committee to redesign the social services system in the cities of Madrid, the capital of Spain, and uh, Malaga. Both cities have a very high percentage of immigrant population. And on the topic of youth pandemic education, I have coordinated two special issues in the year 2021. The Juna Social Work Education, you can consult online and you can see one of these, one of our papers on the screen, no? And we also work on digitalization as a tool to promote the professional activity of social work with migrants. And finally, we have analyzed the digital divide of access and of use. No? Like our technologies, my theoretical point of view is the following. Uh, all technologies, both legal, like law, no? and computer technologies are non neutral. Digitalization is non neutral. Too. Digitalization can strengthen hierarchical processes or favor more egalitarian bonds and egalitarian communication. Our legal model. Our legal system for managing immigration is not neutral either. And our educational system has to take digitalization into consideration to strengthen the competencies and skills of migrants. In, in this sense, you can see on the screen one of our last paper about social work and about food security. No? Food security is one of the negative consequences of the pandemic. COVID-19, which clearly affects users of social services and clearly affects migrants in Spain and Europe. And now with the war, invasion in Ukraine, because we are in a very bad situation. No? In this sense, I'm currently coordinating a European project about innovation and humanitarian response. You can see that on the screen. And, um, we try to, to develop a new learning tools. Um, and in this, in this sense, nuestro, our project takes into consideration the situation of migrants, an object of attention in the Mediterranean aid in the Mediterranean passing, 
with the aim to strengthening the digital competencies. Uh, it's an international conference in, in English this coming July. If you want to come to Ourense, Spain, all of you are invited, no? We, we, it would be great, no? Uh, recent years, my, my perspective in social inclusion, on social inclusion processes has changed. To be honest, I have to do that as a result of my work as executive director of the International Council of Social Welfare, an organization created in 1928 that works for social welfare. And because of the European project I told you about before, no? all of this has led me to deepen my understanding of the concept concept of super diversity. This is on the screen you have the, the World Conference in Seoul in this coming November, October, sorry. Uh, all of you are invited to, no? uh, to, to joining us. Uh, super diversity, super diversity is, um, checking my time, super, di con super diversity, contemporary social reality is increasingly complex in a context that has been transformed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the complexity is related to the growing space for change, increasing mobility and flexibility, increasing the fragmentation of services, professions, and products, and increasing bureaucracy in processes, being that it's impossible, it is impossible to reduce all these problems to a single cause or a clear diagnosis at least to a single answer or solution. As you can see on the screen, the, the, the sorry. Sorry. I'm not, I, I will now divide the rest of my presentation into main sections in the last seven minutes. Uh, firstly, the new context generated by the COVID-19, and second, the main challenges we have to face in the educational field to strengthen the integration process of migrants in Spain digitalization. To talk about the impact of the pandemic, I would like to highlight uh, some characteristics of the Spanish society uh, related to the migratory flows from Latin America. First, as you can see in the key points on the, on the, on the slide, the first in cultural proximity, fundamentally based on the common language, Spanish, for Latin American migrants, integration into the Spanish or Portuguese, in the case of Brazil, the educational system is not very difficult. The common language helps a lot, and children are quickly integrated easily into the school system. Secondly, the super diversity of the Spanish society. Super diversity refers to multiple sources of diversity. Diversity within diversity, no? In such as religious, social, cultural, educational, economic, or gender diversity, as well as age of country of origin, among others. The super diversity of our societies, understood as diversity within diversity, pose a challenge for social workers. And as such, social workers require skills in intercultural communication, mediation, and negotiation. Third, the public, the welfare, the Spanish welfare system, the European welfare system, and the, the public health system, the educational system, and the social services system in Spain are free. You don't have to pay anything. And in this sense, we uh, would like to emphasize that immigrants have access, free access to, to healthcare and education and social services free of charge. And in this sense, the integration is easier than in other countries where healthcare and education are not free. And they have the same facilities that the, that the nationals of Spain. No? Regarding the, the pandemic, uh, uh, people with fewer resources, including migrants, have experienced the limitation resulting from the lack of access to the internet um, and the lack of digital skills. And they have suffered from the limitation the, um, re, um, regarding the site of the housing. And in this sense, the pandemic has led to an accelerated, accelerated process of digitalization in the school environment for national and for migrants. The same because the same are in the same school, in the same places. And five, I think that is important from a theoretical point of view, the design, the, we need to design a welfare system adapted focus on migratory flows. We, one of the priorities of social policies in Spain and Europe 
uh, must be to save world and support migrants. Our welfare model needs to be reorientated and evolve from its current form into something new based on what we call a migrant welfare approach, a migrant welfare, migrant welfare state. Uh, we need to establish a migrant focused welfare state that foster more dynamic and proactive trajectories among migrants. And the educational strategies to integrate migrants are as follows develop, for example, educational program for the children of foreign workers whether or not they are legal residents. In Spain, you are, uh, in spite of you are, you are in an illegal, situ low situation, in a legal situation, you have access to free education and to free healthcare. Um, in, totally independent of your legal situation. Establish educational resources to reduce levels of inequality by increasing the human capital of the migrant population and develop programs for training of women to enable them to enter the labor market under more favorable, favorable conditions. No? And in my last three minutes, I, I want to show with you um, the second point is the um, digital, digitalization process, which has led to put, to put the focus on the digital competencies of migrants and especially young people in Spain and in Europe. No? You can see on the screen in the, in the definition of e social work. Uh, um, and social work and, and social work education can be defined as an area of specialization where the online um, digital environment and in the coming years, the metaverse uh, is the object of analysis, evaluation, and social intervention. You can see here when in educational model that we developed no? and we are working on in Spain uh, with, two, with two positions, professionals and users, and six stages and organized in, in what we call a co-creation process no? with diagnosis, with proposal for improvement, evaluation, etc. And the, the eight priorities that we have to, to organize in this, um, this realm. No? I think that the most important is the first one is not the technology that comes first, but people's, people's problems. And I think that in this sense, to, to close, um, to, to, um, we have to think about the improved, the improved digital skills of migrants no, as a priority in our societies. And, and, and in short, digitalization is already a priority in social work education, and digital skills play a key role in social integration with migrants. And in this sense, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you, I can see you in Spain next time. Um, this is all for my side. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez Pelais. And I want to thank everyone in the panel for keeping to the time. I had the, the terrible job of having to be the timekeeper, but everyone has been doing such a wonderful job. So I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, uh, coming here and with even with everything that happened, being able to deliver your presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Our next uh, and final presenter for today is Graciela Larrea de la Rosa from the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez. Her title of her presentation is Desigualdad Universitaria en Tiempos de Pandemia, Dos Experiencias desde la Escuela Pública y la Privada. Um, Graciela, please. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, are my slides showing up properly? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'll also like to th take the opportunity to thank the Center for Latin American and Border Studies for this opportunity to participate in the education panel. It's been wonderful uh, to hear from the other panelists uh, from their stated uh, point of view of the USA and Mexican border. And also other latitudes um, about the impact of COVID-19. 
uh, on education. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, and to share some of the work I have been doing as part of my doctoral research. In 2019, I start my study I start to study the inequalities in the practices of inclusive higher education in Juarez. And after these two years, I realized that the pandemic showed us more vividly those inequalities besides deepening them. I'm going to talk about university inequality during pandemic times and the approach I have worked uh, with is from the experience of public and private universities. These are the contents I'm going to work with. Um, inclusive higher education is constructed uh, as a, a standardizing narrative um, because social and uh, educative work in university uh, points out that we have to learn how to be inclusive. We have courses, we have uh, uh, documents. However, the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects uh, have revealed historical and new inequalities in, in and outside uh, the uh, university environment. Um, also, the discursive regime of inclusion supposes the implementation of the logical and operational devices that disguise the exclusionary background of educational structures. University inclusion is unequal because it doesn't uh, cover everyone. Some meritocratic mechanisms have increased social and educative inequalities, like um, exams for, for admission. Uh, I want to share these two pictures of, of um, some of the areas of Ciudad Juarez, where are uh, the, so, some of the universities I went to, to do the research. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to, to talk about a um, uh, 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 preview on outline of data and data of the COVID-19 in Ciudad Juarez. First of all, on February uh, 27 of uh, 2020, um, in Mexico, uh, the first infected person was detected uh, uh, by the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. On March 11, the World Health Organization declared that the epidemic transformed into a pandemic. March 15, the Secretaría de Educación Pública is the main office of education in Mexico, decided uh, to close all the schools and educative levels in the country. March 17, in Ciudad Juárez was confirmed the first coronavirus case. March 24, one, the Secretary the La Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores announced that the governments of Mexico and the United States decided to combat the COVID-19 pandemic by restricting non-essential land travel and its borders for 30 days. June 1st, Mexico declares the start of a return to essential activities. December uh, 24, vaccination against COVID-19 begins in Mexico. Uh, April 12 of 2021, first vaccination against COVID-19 begins in Ciudad Juarez. April 20, first vaccination for teachers and the educative sector begins in Mexico. May 19, first vaccination against um, COVID for teachers uh, and the educative sector in Ciudad Juarez. August 26, first vaccination for young, for youth under 20, 26 years old begins in Ciudad Juarez. This represents that until that day, we were able to return to the university 
for face to face classes. August 30, the SEP declares the return to face to face classes, but it was uh, primarily at um, elementary schools. And finally, on January 3rd, most of the universities in Ciudad Juarez return to face to face classes, but uh, in a um, Mm, semi presential um, uh, model. Also, um, in a report made by UNESCO, UNESCO from March 11, 2020 to February 2021, the figure shows that the 20 country, countries with the highest number of days of school closures. Mexico at, uh, in that day have 180 days of closures. Uh, this data says that uh, more than half of the 20 countries are concentrated in Latin America and Caribbean region. What is the objective of this presentation? Uh, the aim is to address the scholarly inequality through the narration of higher education students who live in Ciudad Juarez and face the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects. They are analyzed from two different sides, public and private university students. For this work, for this study, I consider uh, this theoretical framework. Um, inequality is understand um, sorry, inequality is understand, uh, it means different things. Uh, for Dubet, uh, he argues that inequality is a choice and the school has its, its own mechanisms such as academic meritocracy and segregated democracy to reinforce and reproduce inequalities. Meanwhile, third one, says it is a regime and a socio-cultural order that reduces vital, ex existential and resource capacities of people to participate in the world. And Gonzalo Sarabi, who made a, a study of Mexican students, uh, says that a school and university experience an unequal inclusion fragmented or reciprocal exclusion. In everyday life, popular and privileged classes have differentiated as access to the school world. Um, the qualitative methodology, uh, it's the, the way I used to, to do this study. I consider the interpretative paradigm and the technique that I use is in the uh, interviews. The premises of this methodology uh, consider uh, depth and subjectivity um, as, as the most important instead of representative. Um, this methodology rescues the historical, material, and political dimension of the facts and also considers subjectivity and intersubjectivity of educational actors. Now, what are, are the findings that, uh, the preliminary findings? First of all, um, in public uh, universities that, that I work with, uh, they used to pay 100 US dollars, US, US dollars for uh, a period of four months. Meanwhile, private uh, schools, um, they have a, a tuition payment of 5,000 US dollars for six months of, of the duration of the semester. Uh, in public uh, schools, um, they didn't have a scholarships as in private. They, the, the, the universities um, offer uh, payment agreements in parts during those four months. 
also uh, in public schools they offer uh, the, the only um, the only um, help that they, they provided during pandemic times were psychological attention uh, through uh, virtual uh, programs. And in private schools, they offer psychological attention, workshops for anti-stress, relaxation, and mindfulness. And um, in public uh, universities, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, they use Facebook, WhatsApp, email to communicate with the students because they didn't have uh, a system to work and, and to the classes uh, by synchronic uh, way. But in private uh, schools, they have since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, learning management systems like uh, Zoom, Teams, Classroom, etc. Uh, in public schools, uh, students, uh, says that they have limited space uh, spaces inside the house. Some of them uh, take uh, classes in their beds and others says that they have to go to the bathroom to avoid the noises of the family and the neighborhood. Uh, meanwhile, in private, uh, students uh, says that the, some of them have a special a space to study with a desk, minimum one for for uh, for the family. So sometimes they share the that space, and um, if, if they have uh, brothers or, or sisters that were studying. Other thing is that uh, public um, uh, universities, the students says that they have. A uh, poor internet connection because of the area uh, where they they live. And uh, in private schools, they have a very good internet connection. Students from public universities says that uh, they use their cell phones for virtual classes because they didn't have uh, good laptops or desk computers to take classes. So that they that the only way to to take classes uh, was by their phones, and uh, sometimes they they use the laptop or desktop uh, computers to do homework. Meanwhile, in private uh, universities, they have laptop for virtual classes and and homework. That was uh, a problem for public. Uh, universities because they didn't uh, the, the universities didn't offer equipment for the students or another help also uh, in public universities uh, the students says that uh, some of them have to work to support family economy some of, of them told me that they went to night shift um and and they were uh, in la maquila uh, meanwhile uh, students from private universities says that they work to learn uh, most of the times and they work in family business and uh, some of them work uh during a semester of of rest some of, of them take um one semester to rest because they uh, wanted to take advantage of of the um, university facilities once they return to face-to-face -face classes because they said that i'm paying too much uh, and i'm losing that opportunity of use all the facilities courses uh contact and uh i don't want to lose that so i am uh, i decided to to take a rest for one semester. Meanwhile, uh, students for, from public uh, universities said that um, 
Taking uh, one semester to rest represents leaving a school or miss uh, completed semesters. So they didn't, they, they wanted to, to leave the schools because they feel burned out, but they think that if they take the, that rest, they will abandon the school for forever. And some of the um, findings that uh, the students from public and private uh, universities told me that uh, they told me that uh, virtual education does not provide significant theoretical and practical learning. Some of them told me, no me sentía que estaba en la universidad. Eh, la verdad es que eh, estaba en mi casa, me distraía, solamente entraba a clases para eh, porque pues tenía que, pero, pero no, no podía concentrarme. Eh, yo para poder este, eh, salir adelante, pues lo que hacía era que a veces no entraba a clases, pero este, luego buscaba a mis compañeros para, para ver qué habían dejado de tarea. Also, um, I uh, some of the findings is that uh, peer support is critical to learning and college life. Some of the students said that uh, they uh, finished the, the university because of the support of their friends and classmates. That says that if they uh, had, if they um, didn't have that support, they will not be able to finish. Uh, some of, the, of them told me, la relación con mis compañeros de clases era inexistente. For some of the students, um, they, they think that uh, those, those months of, of uh, confinement, they didn't um, take um, or had the opportunity to, to meet their classmates. So um, they didn't have uh, that relationship with their classmates. Uh, for some of the students from private uh, universities, uh, they have to, to return to their um, home because some of them uh, went to study to another cities. And they said that they uh, didn't have any contact with their students. So um, both groups told me that uh, peer support is basic. Gracias, uh, Thank you. We, thank you. we have now five minutes for questions. Um, so uh, if you can uh, all turn on your uh, Zoom cameras. We have my five minutes for questions. Sorry, I had to, to cut off your last slide, Graciela, but um, we had gone uh, five minutes over time. So if anyone wants to post questions on the Q&A session, please feel free to post any questions. We will be happy to answer them and pose them here to our very important panelists. Thank you uh, all of you for your great, presentations. Dr. Antonio Lopez Pelaez had to leave, um, so we will hopefully get some questions for our three remaining panelists. I know I have a lot of different questions, but, uh, but I'll leave uh, the public to... I'll let the public ask some of them. Please use your Q&A button on the bottom to ask questions that you want answered by the panelists. So uh, Daniel Aguilar asks, addressing the digital divide, we saw an abnormal increase in sales personnel hotspots and iPads with parents paying for their children to have internet access with an increase of typically a minimum of $30 in all rural areas of Southern New Mexico. Is there any interest in quantifying the financial impact of this specific question? Or do any of you have any plans of doing some of that? 
I'll jump in. I, uh, sorry, I hate Zoom pauses as people wait for the next one to talk. Uh, I've been looking along with a professor at University of North Texas into the impact of um, the digital divide uh, in Southern New Mexico specifically, where school districts handed out these laptops. Again, I refer to them as bricks to students who didn't have internet access. They then were worked agreements with cellular companies to offer what was considered low income internet service for these families. Uh, but for many families, $30 a month isn't in their budget. And so what they were doing is essentially denying those students an education. Uh, this was particularly troublesome in Northern New Mexico where you have a number of uh, indigenous communities that don't have cell service, even with mobile hotspots, they couldn't impact, they couldn't uh, submit their work. And they were essentially given packets of paper and told, bring them back in the fall. So they were essentially teaching themselves. Um, and I would say, um, Danielle, thank you for the question. I would say, you know, that this is definitely a challenge for a, a, a lot of families uh, paying those to those uh, internet fees. So school district actually use um, the the one that I study. They actually use the the ESSER funds to increase the the access of hotspot and uh, in uh, Wi-Fi, and they also are in process of. Um, uh, finding ways to create their own internet uh, uh, broadband uh, system because um, some of the companies like uh, uh, Verizon or um, AT&T, they are, um, even though they provided internet, but they, they're not providing enough um, locations in this area. And uh, they're asking their fee is also very expensive. So the school district also wanted to decrease the cost of that. And while they're able to providing those um, services to all students, so they are in the process of, uh, of um, um, finding their own ways to uh, create broadband access to students. Um, it's very challenging because, uh, you know, the, the internet, um, uh, broadband uh, market is is still very privatized. So um, the big, large companies, they're the one getting most of the control and they're lobbying in DC to prevent um, uh, small areas like, uh, you know, like the border areas to uh, create their own internet access. They wanted to um, be the monopoly basically in, in order to, um, uh, um, benefit their their own business. So it's a challenge and the school district acknowledge it and they're working on some school districts are working on it, but it, deep down it's really the 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 financial access of um, creating the opportunity to help all students. And uh, I will also like to answer the second question is that is there any ex examples of or state entities that is uh, tackle these issues? Well, the state and the federal government actually provide, the federal government provide ESSER funds to, uh, to, um, to encourage schools to address the technology access issues and then the mental health issues and then and it's uh, learning loss issues. Um, but those monies are, um, we, there, there's a, a school, university studying how those ESSER funds are being allocated and used. So there are school that receive the fundings, but they are not unnecessarily using them yet. So it's still, um, it's still a slow process of evaluating how those resources are being used. Um, but in terms of in the border area, the schools are eager to use those funds to help the students, especially the uh, English language learners and students who are in, living in the high poverty areas. They, they're the one being impacted the most, uh, but at the same time, they, they apply those fundings, but they're, they're still, some of the school districts are still waiting for the funding to receive the funding in order to use it. And uh, um, so the, there, there are definitely, and state level that um, the state is, um, Texas is acknowledging the issue of teacher shortage issues. So they're taking actions of um, uh, providing teachers, uh, providing the 
school district with some initiatives to address teacher shortage issues and then providing more um, incentives for students, uh, undergrad students to uh, to choose uh, the career of being an, an educator. Um, so there are definitely um, state and then district are taking act active um, um, actions to address these issues, but I would say this is only in the border area and because I, I do hear school uh, district in other areas that's not in the border areas. They are not Title I school district. They take less um, active role of addressing students who are in need, especially English language learners, because they have other priorities other priorities to address issues that is for students in general and not in particular to the students that is um, that is more populated in the uh, border area. Thank you. Uh, we have another question and, and I know we're a little bit of, of time, but uh, that's why we spent 15 minutes between sessions so that we could go over time. Uh, this is again for all panelists from Emily Gregg. Do you have any examples of civil society or state entities who have tackled some of these issues successfully? In the case of my study, um, I think the Deming School District has gone uh, be over and above in trying to solve some of the issues faced by the transfronterizos. They have taken on challenges, legal and otherwise, um, by people who are opposed to people, even though they're US citizens crossing the border to come to these schools. Uh, they have found ways uh, through, as I said, loopholes so that they can provide food uh, and necessary nutrition to students during the pandemic for those kids living south of the border. They've turned on hotspots uh, 24 hours a day at the library, city hall, uh, et cetera. Uh, they manage to find loopholes with the Department of Agriculture when they are in school for children who are living in Mexico who don't have a residence in the district, which is one of those rules that becomes tricky. Um, in Lordsburg, the next school district over, um, they refuse to allow students to cross because they don't have an address within the school district. So I, I think Deming is, is setting an example on what can be done to help these students. I really look forward to hitting other schools, even the schools that Dr. Sun is talking about in the borderland and in the lower valley that have these students that cross as well every day. I know in El Paso, they cross every day to attend schools. So they've clearly found a way uh, to get around those requirements. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. I really do hope that this also, this session, not only was fascinating to me and fascinating hopefully to all of our participants, but I really do hope that in this session, we made some connections. I hope Dr. Weiss, Dr. Soon, Graciela, you could prob hopefully start working on something together since you have so many points of, in common. Um, maybe this is a, a great way to start some new projects. I always envisioned this symposium to be that, to, to be the opportunity for early career scholars to not only present their work, have their work out there, but also to start making connections with other scholars and hopefully create research teams. So. You're reading my mind. I was thinking exactly the same thing as I was listening to Dr. Sun's uh, presentation. I was like, She's got my lit review. Oh, good. I don't have to do that. <laughs> it's, it's very similar, very similar. Well, thank you again for uh, all of our participants in this panel for engaging, interesting, and frankly, although we no knew this, very sobering presentations of the really difficult situation that COVID has made worse for Transfronteriza students, for students in Latin America, and uh, for immigrant students in Europe. I really do appreciate all of your presentations, and I hope you are willing to submit them to the conference proceedings that we're gonna have and that we will publish. For everyone else that's in the session, thank you so much for attending this session. We will see you in about 10 more minutes or so, nine more minutes in the migration session.
Dr. Wise, Dr. Soon, Graciela, thank you very much. I appreciate it and see you next time. Thank you so much. And I'm going to write my colleagues to talk about what you propose. Fantastic. Thank you.